recording started. Okay, welcome to the study hall for December 2nd, 2010. Today's topic is going to be the essays by popular request. So we're going to talk about the goal of today is to get you to the point where you can write these essays pretty effortlessly. Because remember, you don't need to be able to put together something that's beautiful or worthy of a sort of prize for writing. You just have to be able to write competently and, and decently and produce something that makes sense. So that's the point. But first, as usual, we have to open with the usual warnings. So you know the drill. It's kind of like whenever you take an airplane flight, you need to hear the usual warnings about safety and emergency procedures. Same thing, we've got to give you the warnings about submissions. So the usual, don't submit things that are too general. Um, a lot of people have bad habits of submitting like whole areas, like how do I do geometry or how do I solve problems faster. Also, don't submit things that are too specific. Um, the forums are the place for that. If you just have a question about one problem and a couple of choices, then please post that to the forum instead of the study hall. Um, personal issues also, this is not the place. Those go on the forums. We have two folders that you can use to post personal questions. The first one of those is the general folder. That's for questions about your study plan, here's my score, here's where I want to be, what should I do kind of thing. And then there's also an ask an admissions consultant folder. So if you have any questions about B school admissions. The questions we want to see, intermediate depth, so not so specific that it's better as a forum question, but not so general that it's just kind of not reasonable to consider doing it in, in an hour and a half. So, and then if you do have a specific question, please tie it into a more general question. So, okay. Um, don't forget when you submit something specific, you got to cite the source, please. So, if you submit specific problems, you can't just give us a problem. You have to tell us where it came from. Okay. Um, also, please check the archives. A lot of you guys are submitting, in fact, I think the majority of submissions this week were for things that are already covered in the existing, um, that are already covered in the existing things. So, for example, a couple people submitted just basic questions about rate, time, distance. We've already got a rate time distance show from April 29th that you can watch in the archive. Um, a couple people this week submitted basic questions about timing considerations that we've already pretty much covered on August 5th and so on. So please check the list of existing recordings before you submit stuff. A lot of the things people have lately been submitting have already been in that archive. Okay, finally, you saw these last time, but here's some examples of questions that we don't want to see. These are examples of things that are way too specific. Um, please elucidate in that versus because on this question. Classic forum question. It's got a very pointed, very specific answer. That's the kind of thing that belongs in the forum, not here. Um, specific question about a specific page in the book belongs in the forum. Very particular math problem with no general questions goes in the forum. Also notice that these submissions also violated the guidelines where they didn't tell us where the problem came from. In these two cases, they didn't tell us where the problem is from. And in these two cases, they didn't give us answer choices. So please tell us the whole problem with all the answer choices and where it's from. These are examples of things that are way too general. Um, I mean, it goes so far as this one, which is literally everything you could possibly ever do in a GMAT class would fall under this category. Um, but these things would, would take many, many, many hours. So these are not really study hall topics. This is the kind of thing that should go in the general folder on the forum. Remember, these are recordings that are watched by hundreds of people. So. 
personal study plans are kind of inappropriate here. And then also, you cannot submit OG questions. There were about six people this past couple weeks who submitted problems from the official guide. If you do that, we will just have to ignore them because of copyright reasons. Okay, smiley face if you guys understand submissions, not submissions. These are things that are not okay. If you get these guidelines, smiley face icon, which is over there. All right, so let's take a look. Today's, again, today's study hall is about the AWA assays. Kind of meant to fill in a little bit of a hole in the curriculum because we don't treat the essays a whole lot in our existing curriculum, mostly because they're not terribly important. But still, what should be your main goal when you write these essays? What do you guys think? In the text box, what do you think should be your main goal when you write the essays? Let's go ahead and get some opinions on this in the text box. Okay, a couple of you are writing. I'll wait until you uh, wait until your answers are shown on the screen. Okay, about four or five of you are still writing, so I'll wait. Okay, a couple of you are finishing up, but all right, a couple of you, if you can see the text box. Um, a couple of you guys are writing things that are true but are sort of overly basic. For example, um, it's true that you need to follow the directions, but I mean, of course, you have to follow the directions. Um, also, it's true that you have to support whatever your argument is, but, but of course you do. Um, I'm looking at something a little bit more deep than that, which is kind of like, what's the, the point of this? Where I'm going with this is your main goal is to have a protocol or procedure so that you don't have to make a lot of decisions that you're not accustomed to making. But most importantly, um, most importantly, the deal is to make the essay effortless. That's kind of where I'm going with this. So the, the goal of today's session, hopefully, is to give you a protocol that will give you a consistent way of doing this so that it takes away the element of effort. And the reason why, I mean, in other words, wh where I'm going with this is you are better off with a medium quality essay that requires little effort than with an excellent essay that requires a lot of effort. Because remember how the grading works on this thing. The essays are not really like other parts of this test. On the other parts of the test, you really want to try to score as many points as you possibly can. On the essay, that's much less important. On the essay, as, as long as you have a score that is not bad, you are fine. Like you're not really any better off with a six than you would be with a four or even a three and a half, three kind of thing. So effortless is, is the goal. The reason why is because remember um, the essay is first, so you want to be able to write it without wasting a great deal of so-called mental capital. That's the point. So hopefully at the end of this study hall, you'll have a little bit of a better idea of how you can compose these essays without spending a lot of effort doing so. So let's talk about this. Um, the issue essay is first in line. So what do we want to do with the issue essay? And here are a number of, of things that we can think about. And um, one of you guys is mentioning in the text box the CAST kind of thing. Um, that's what I'm going to try to do today is try to give some angles on these things that are not overlapping with what's in the course. So 
I'm not going to reteach you guys the the existing Manhattan GMAT approach to the essays. Instead, I'm going to try to give you some new perspectives or new angles on this stuff. So here's some things that, that we'll think about here. How do you pick topics? Especially what if I have trouble picking a topic? This is something we'll spend a little bit of time on because, um, you know, it's not really, I mean, some people get stuck with writer's block, so to speak, meaning some people just freeze and have a hard time thinking of a topic. So we'll talk about a possible approach that will help you take care of that kind of issue. Should I argue both sides of the issue or just one? How should I structure it? In what order should I write the parts of the essay? And notice this question doesn't mean what order should they appear in. It's what order should I write them in, which is my, my answer to this may be a little bit surprising to some of you guys. And then as far as how should you write, are there any basic pointers of, of the style that you should use here? So, okay, here's a sample essay prompt. Right here, this is not an official prompt. This is a prompt that I basically just made up at random. But, okay, here's a prompt. People's values, even their most deeply held moral beliefs, are not consistent. Changes in the way a situation is presented, even small ones, can drastically affect people's ethical judgment of that situation. Okay, so first of all, do you understand what the prompt is saying? If you guys understand this prompt, give me a smiley face. If you're having trouble understanding what the prompt is even talking about, then give me the other face. Okay, I'm getting mostly smiley faces, so okay, I got one or two not so smiley faces. A quick summary. Um, if you have trouble understanding the prompt, I guess let's, let's talk about let's talk about that first before we do how do I choose a topic. What if I have trouble understanding a prompt? So this is a good question. I mean, you know, if you have trouble understanding the prompt in the first place, you, you're definitely going to have trouble understanding how to write about it. So let's talk about how would you, like wh where would you go with this kind of thing? One realization that's important to make when you, when you see the prompt is that if there is more than one sentence, the sentences will usually say very similar things. Okay, for instance, um, most, most issue prompts are just one sentence, but um, some of them are more than one. No, normally we're not supposed to post things from the official guide, but I'll post one sentence from the official guide as fair use here. Um, Here's a prompt from the official guide. This is one of the, in, in case you guys don't know, chapter 10 of the official guide gives you about a billion different essay prompts. So here, here's this, like, this is another two-sentence prompt. The first sentence is formal education should not come to an end when people graduate from college. That's a sentence. Instead, people should frequently enroll in courses throughout their lives. Another sentence. But basically, these are saying the same kind of thing. So basically, they both say that people should keep educating themselves after they leave school. So people should keep taking, taking classes. So same sort of thing is going on here. So you don't have to, you may not have to understand exactly as much as you think you would. A consequence of this is that if there's more than one sentence, then you may only have to understand one of them. Because usually, as we've said, if there are multiple sentences, more often than not, they say the same thing anyway, or are very close to the same thing. If it's not, if it's a one-sentence prompt that you're having trouble with, then 
imagine, okay, if you, if you still have trouble approaching the prompt, here's the way you would approach it. You would almost approach it like a sentence correction problem. Think like sentence correction. Eliminate modifiers. You know, eliminate modifiers and subordinate clauses. And what you are left with is going to be the most important part of the sentence. So if you have trouble understanding this prompt, well, that's a modifier. So we can get rid of that temporarily. And then that's a modifier, so we can get rid of that temporarily too. So um, for those of you who gave me the non-smiley face, this may help you understand what this prompt is talking about. People's values are not consistent. That's probably better. That's probably easier to understand. So once you figure that out, then you can go back to the details. But basically, at the end of the day, this, this thing says people's values are not consistent. That's what it says. So we're talking about people's values kind of changing at random or something like that. Okay. Um, so smiley face, everybody, if you guys understand the prompt, I mean, a couple of you, Amelia gave a nice summary of the prompt in the text box, but you guys are, uh, okay, smiley face. All right, now, how do I choose a topic? Well, Basically, the, the most important guideline here is you should be really specific. You should tell a story. You should definitely be a storyteller here. If you don't see just how important it is to be specific, then check out the highest graded sample issue essay in the OG, it tells a very detailed story about the, the quality and reliability of Yugo automobiles. I don't know if you guys have read the sample essay or not, but it's, it's very detailed. It has lots and lots of stuff in it. So, um, be specific. That's the point. So, and along with this, one thing that's po one thing that you probably understand is that it's not really possible to be specific and to be general at the same time. So, hold on a sec. Okay, you can't really be specific and be general at the same time. So, one consequence of this then is that. You don't need to be general. And I mean, it's tempting. It's tempting to be very general about this stuff because the topics are, are usually going to be pretty sweeping. They're usually going to have a rather wide scope. Like this essay topic is pretty much about lots and lots of stuff. It's about you know, anybody's moral values in any sort of situation type of thing. So. Don't worry about covering the entire range of topics described by a prompt. I, ideally, the fewer examples, the better off you are. Um, ideally, you want fewer examples and more detail. That's the point. Because this is how people really do treat these kinds of things in normal approaches. It's like case studies. That's the best way to think about it. Smiley face if you guys know what a case study is. Okay, a case study is when you're looking in, in extreme detail at one or two very particular examples of something. In other words, when you do, I mean, in fact, in business school, there are a lot of case studies. You know, you, you don't, when you take classes in business school, 
you don't try to treat the full scope of, of topics most of the time. You usually just look at exceedingly specific cases. So it's like taking a case study approach to this sort of thing. Fewer examples, more detail. So, okay, we're going to continue this to the next page. All right. Be specific, tell a story. You, you don't need to be general. And also, another thing very important is that you don't need to be formal or scholarly. A lot of people feel pressured into picking topics that have you know, extreme significance in terms of, of politics or history or something like that. You don't need to select a topic that is politically or historically important. In fact, it's it's good depending on what the topic is. I mean, if it's if it's appropriate, if it's relevant, then you are perfectly fine talking about you know what happened to you this weekend. Just as good. I mean, you are just as well off talking about you know your experience this past weekend than you are talking about World War II or something like that. So. Specific, not too many different examples. You don't want to be all over the place, and you don't want to be scholarly. At least you don't have to be. If you can be scholarly, of course, that's that's nice. But you certainly don't have to be that way. And in fact, if you look at the kinds of prompts that you're going to see, um, they do tell you in the directions. I mean, as Amelia pointed out, one of your goals here is to, is to be following the directions. So if you look at the actual directions that they give you, the directions basically give you explicit permission not to be scholarly. Like if you look at this, you, you are totally okay talking about your own experience observations or reading. And I mean your own experience and observations can be stuff that happened to you last week. So okay. Um, any questions, go ahead and type in the text box. Otherwise we're going to move on to an important topic, which is how in the world do I actually um, choose a topic? As far as okay, the question in the text box is is it's easy to disagree with the author. Generally, it's a yes/no question. I mean, it's it's disagreeing or agreeing with the author is is almost irrelevant. It's really just taking a stand on an issue. So, um, in other words, okay, we can add another point in in response to that. Um, you don't need to worry about about which way the open quote original author quote goes on the issue. In, in other words, um, as an example, if you got the prompt, if you got a prompt that said people's beliefs are not consistent, and I got a prompt that said people's views are consistent, then, then we would pick exactly the same topics. Because, I mean, it doesn't really matter which, which way the, the, the author goes. I mean, because in, in each of these cases, the issue is the same. So in each case, the issue is the same. In other words, whether or not people's beliefs are consistent. Okay, hold on just a sec. All right, so I hope this answers the uh, question in the text box about, about agreeing or disagreeing with the author. It doesn't really matter because it doesn't, you just have to decide what the issue is. Um, there's a question in the text box that says, what if you can't remember all the numbers? You, I, I don't think they're really going to fact check. Um, remember you're being graded on your writing. 
So uh, let me add another point in response to that. Um, don't be deterred if you don't remember some exact detail. I remember you're being graded ultimately on your writing skill and not on your like accurate recollection of history. I mean, this isn't a history test. It's it's a writing test. So, therefore, if you have to fudge numbers um, a bit or be vague, you know, like just saying a majority rather than a percentage, etc. Then you're going to be fine. Um, also, even if your facts are inaccurate, you'll be fine. The one thing I don't know about, I don't really know either way, is what they will do if um, is what they will do if like your facts are just so wildly inaccurate that it's ridiculous. Like if you have World War II being fought in 1994 between Illinois and Brazil, then then you might have some issues. But I don't. Other than that, short of that kind of thing, I don't really know whether you're going to have problems with factual basis for stuff. So you can you can feel free to elaborate on things creatively, so to speak. Um, as far as the both sides issue, which is typed in the text box, we'll, we'll handle that in a sec. Okay, now let's talk about this. How do I choose a topic? In particular, what if I have trouble choosing a topic? So this is a good question because um, a lot of people have trouble. A lot of people have writer's block where they don't really know what to write about. Because remember, you are under a severe time constraint. So, well, let's try this. Here's an experiment. This is going to seem kind of random to you guys, but, okay. Think of three words that start with See. Okay, three words. I mean, you don't have to write them down, but just come, just think of three words. I bet a lot of you are probably finding this weirdly harder than you would think. Like, you would think that you could just bam, 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 generate three words, but it probably takes you a couple seconds. You know, you get stuck. Now I'll try this. Think of a country that starts with C. Okay, bam, you probably thought of one. It's not very hard. Maybe Chile, maybe Croatia, maybe Colombia, you know, but a country. You find one. Now think of a food that starts with C. Bam, you probably have one. Carrot, cream, chocolate, you know, it's, it's weird. And then, like, think of an animal that starts with C. So, I mean, probably cat, but maybe crocodile or something like that. But you think of these things pretty quickly. And what most people find, as weird as, the, as, weird as this is, most people find, to, the, to their surprise, that doing this is actually harder than picking the specific things. I mean, in terms of pure numbers, this makes no sense at all. Because, I mean, if you think about the number of words that you know that start with C, it's some incredible number of words. Like, even if English is your second language, you probably know tens of thousands of words that start with C. But weirdly enough, for most people, it's easier to think of things in these specific categories. So the point of this experiment, let's see if you guys know where we're going with this. Like, like, what do you think, aside from to kind of weirdly surprise you, to give you your fun topic of the day, what do you think is the point of this?
It's well better to be specific, yeah, kind of. But but words that start with C are specific too. The, the the point here is this. The point is that thinking of things from very general categories, like words that start with C, is is much harder than you might think. On the other hand, thinking of things from reasonably specific categories it is easier. I mean, as strange as it is, a lot of people have an easier time thinking of a food that starts with C than thinking of a word that starts with C, which based on logic that makes no sense at all because any food that starts with C is also a word that starts with C. But still, people have a hard time with, with this sort of Thing. So, this is the same reason why people have a hard time coming up with essay topics. The reason why people have a hard time coming up with essay topics is the prompt is too general. It's the same sort of thing, like come up with an example of this is a lot like come up with a word that starts with C. It's so general that nothing jogs your memory. So here's the cure for this. Um, what, what I've found that works well is, is to break the prompt up into a menu of subcategories. All right, so for example, here's what I mean. Um, the bad prompt, so let's continue this analogy from up there. The bad prompt, it's bad because it's overly general. The bad prompt is something like, give me a word that starts with C. But the sub prompts, which are easier, is, you know, give me an animal that starts with C. Or give me a food that starts with C. Or give me, etc. Give me a country. Here's how you can do this for an essay prompt. An overly general prompt, it is too general, would be something like, give me a specific situation in which people's beliefs are or are not consistent. I mean, for most people, that's really hard because there's no prompt. So instead, what you can do, here's how you can make sub prompts for this. Instead of just doing that overall, break it down into different areas that you know about. So like, give me a specific situation from your personal life in which people's beliefs have or haven't been consistent. I bet a lot of you can think of something like that almost instantly. It's probably much, much easier to think of things like that. Or if I say something like, give me a situation from a book or article you've read recently. in which people's beliefs have or haven't been consistent. Or like, give me a situation 
from you know your studies in which people's beliefs have or haven't been consistent. Etc. And then I mean you you should you should tailor these sub prompts to you. Like if there's a if there's an area that you happen to know a lot about, then so you just do that. So give me a situation from area X X X that you know a lot about. Etc. So, like for example, if you know a lot about the history of, of some country, like India or something like that, then fine. Give me a situation from the history of India in which people's beliefs haven't been consistent. Or if you know a lot about, you know, a particular religion or a lot about a particular music type or something like that. Anything. So, these kinds of prompts will usually make your life a lot easier. So if you have trouble coming up with a topic, make a menu of subcategories and then use those subcategories to generate some sort of response. So and you will probably find that this helps. And remember that if even one of these subprompts gives you a good topic, then you're set. You've got something that you can write about. So there you go. So then what you can do based on that on on that research or finding topics you know pick your one to three favorites from your list so pick one to three favorites to write about depending on how much you know or how much detail you're going to be able to write. So that's what you should do. I mean, if you know a lot about something, like the if you guys know the Yugo essay from the official guide, if you know a lot about some topic, then you um, are set. Like if you know lots and lots and lots of detail and can very quickly rattle off tons of detail about something, then that's it. All that, that one topic is all you need. On the other hand, if you don't know as much detail um, as one of the students was asking upstairs, if you don't remember a lot of facts and figures or specifics, then you might want to introduce a couple of examples. The, the danger of introducing multiple examples is that you have to make sure that your multiple examples actually transition in some way. Like the one thing you don't want to do is just randomly stop talking about something and start talking about something else. But otherwise, okay. Um, Jason said, I think you should set out exactly what you mean. So here's the prompt again, in case you forgot what the prompt was. And, yeah, you don't have to be talking about moral beliefs. And notice it says even their most deeply held moral beliefs. So you have the, this is a modifier, you have the option of talking about moral beliefs or not. You could talk about other values. But you, you, the good thing about having, the good thing about having specific sub prompts like this is that you don't need to set that out ahead of time because the situation will take care of that for you. Like let's say that from your personal life, I don't know, let's say your your cousin got really mad at someone for stealing from him, but then he turned around and stole from someone else. You know, if that's the situation that comes to mind, then you already have a definition of values in this case. In this case, it's values about when is it okay to steal and not to steal. You're talking about that kind of ethics. And I mean, the good thing about thinking of topics like this is you don't have to set out definitions ahead of time because they will happen. Like if you come up with a specific idea, then the definitions will all kind of magically fall into place based on your example. So, okay, I mean, let me know if that makes sense, smiley face, whatever. But you no, you don't usually need to restrict the topic ahead of time because thinking of something like this will just take care of that automatically. It's, it's kind of nice. So, um, okay. Que next question on our list here is, is should I argue both sides of the issue or, or just one? 
this is one of those things where there's not really a short, concise answer. So, I mean, the responsible answer to this question is sort of long, so I'm going to give you that sort of long answer, which is, it depends. The short answer is it depends. Okay. Well, here's the long answer. Um, if you're only going to write about one specific example, then obviously not. I mean, then you're going to take one side accordingly. So, in that case, it's easy to answer the question. If you're only going to write about one example, then you're going to take whatever side your example happens to dictate. On the other hand, where the issue gets murky is if you're going to write about more than one example, you, you can take both sides. But you have to do so in a way that is still decisive. Okay, um, l l let me show you what I mean. Because my, my example for, for this prompt, the, the, the prompt I gave you here, the example I'm going to flesh out is only one side of the issue. So I'll, I'll make up a new prompt. And... Um, I'll show you how you might responsibly take both sides of an issue. Like, for, here's a sample prompt. Sample prompt would be something like, is it, this is similar to one of the prompts in the official guide. Is, is it better to, to use one's power to its fullest potential, or is it better to use only as much Force, or, or is it better to restrain one's power? Yeah. So let, let let's say that you came up with um, let's say that you came up with the following two examples. Let's say you came up with this, like let's say your sub prompt was give a situation from history in which power was either restrained or not restrained. Um, and let's say that, that history prompt made me come up with something like this. The example would be something like um, when, I don't know if you guys know about the history of World War II or not, but when Neville Chamberlain restrained British power and came up with and, and followed the policy of appeasement with Hitler. Uh, the results were negative, let's just say the least. When his successor, Churchill, released the full might of British military power, the results were better. So, I mean, this takes the clear side of the issue um, of, of yes, you should use all of your power. But then an example like, like number two is, um, let's say you have a sub prompt. Let's say your next sub prompt was something like, give a situation from your personal life in which power was either restrained or not restrained. And let's say you had, I mean, let's say your next example was, you know, when my 
cousin was arrested for a violent offense, he was given a short sentence. Um, but but that experience alone was enough to to get him back on a better path. I mean, the idea, just being the other way around, like the idea is that if, if the court had issued the maximum sentence, his life would have been ruined. So these are two opposite examples. I mean, the basic deal here is, is that, it, here's what I mean by decisive. Now that we have two examples to use, I can, I can show you what I mean. Um, a, a bad way to do this, a bad thesis with these examples would be something like, sometimes power should be expressed to its fullest, but sometimes it shouldn't. I mean, that's a bad thesis because it doesn't really say anything. I mean, you guys see what the problem is here. The problem is that this doesn't take any kind of sign at all. This is just waffling and, and not really saying anything. So, I mean, this is a self-contradictory statement. It doesn't even say anything. So that's the danger with taking both sides of the issue. A lot of people think taking both sides of the issue means that you need to say yes and no. Or, well, maybe, but maybe not. Or possibly yes, possibly no. The problem with possibly yes, possibly no is that it means nothing. So it, it's not an appropriate thesis. But a good way to do this would be something like, in personal cases, it's best to restrain power unless its fuller use is absolutely necessary. But when a nation's, I mean, when a nation's very existence is threatened by, you know, military enemies, it, it should not hesitate to use all its power. So you guys can see what's better about this thesis. Like, it takes both sides of the issue, but it's still decisive, because what it does is it, it makes a distinction. It doesn't just say yes and no. It's in this very specific case, yes, but in this other very specific case, no or vice versa. So, I mean, this is, if you're going to take both sides, this is how you should do it. You, you should take both sides in a way that is extremely clear about which side is to be taken and when. So, let me summarize that up there. If, so, it's, it's kind of a dangerous game to play. I mean, you're probably, if you're, if you're not so experienced at writing these things, or if you are a second language English speaker and so you don't write as quickly, you should probably stick with, you know, a, a single side of the issue because you may not be able to get specific enough. But if you're going to take both sides, um, make sure that you make some sort of distinction between when the issue is settled one way and when it's settled the other way. Okay, do not just have a maybe, maybe not type of thesis. Okay, so smiley face if you see kind of where, where we're at with that. Um, I, I would still, if I had to issue a recommendation, I would say something like, it, it, if you're on the fence about it, I would just stick with a single side of the issue because it's easier to write a focused essay about a single side of the issue. But, you know, if you have to, then, then okay. So, yeah, the question in the text box, is there a preferable way? Not really. And I mean, three examples is also kind of a lot. Um, 
it, it, I, I would definitely not ever use more than three examples because if you do, you, you kind of get the whole changing the channel thing going on where, where it's like, whoa, this essay has no focus kind of thing. But if you can tie together three examples without abruptly changing the channel, then, then go ahead. But in general, more detail is better than more examples. Okay, now um, let's talk about structure and let's talk about in what order. One, there's a question in the text box of how long does the essay have to be. That's totally a function of how much you can type. Um, I can't really give general length recommendations because some people can type literally four or five times as fast as other people can. Like some people can type 100 words a minute and some people can type 20. So it's really going to depend on, on typing speed as opposed to like handwritten essays where everyone's kind of the same speed as everybody else. But um, yeah, four paragraphs, two examples, totally fine. So now let's talk about this. How should I structure the essay? In what order should I write the parts of the essay? So, I mean, you, if you're not sure, I mean, if you have a lot of chops as a writer, you can probably use unusual essay structures. But I would say the safest bet is to have a short intro in which you present your thesis i.e. take whatever side you're going to take and then briefly allude to your examples. Right. Then body paragraphs, the body paragraphs are where you tell the story of your examples. Um, or ordinarily, you would probably use one body paragraph per example. But if you, I mean, if it gets to the point where, um, if, it, if you're talking in too much detail, if you have lots and lots and lots of detail, then split the paragraphs up at logical points because really long paragraphs are unattractive. Okay. Um, and then you should have a very, very brief conclusion. Um, you can do one of two things. One option is to just recap what you've already said, mostly in your intro. Another option is you can, I don't know if you guys have watched my, my study hall on reading comps, but another option you can have is what some of those reading comps do, which is you can have a focus shift. I mean, you can close with, with a shift of focus. Um, maybe an exception or, or some sort of relevant question. This is more, this is more risky. This is a riskier option. It's good writing form. I, I wouldn't go there unless you're a decently good writer already. Um, if you have trouble writing the essays, I wouldn't do this. But if you are already a decently good essay writer, it can be um, it can be good. Okay, now this might sound like a really stupid question, but in what order should I write the parts of the essay? I mean, maybe that sounds like it's a just really dumb question. I mean, I bet a lot of people are thinking, well, I should just write the intro, and then I should write the body paragraphs, and then I should write the conclusion. Um, do any of you have any different thoughts on that? writing these things in a different order. Like the fact that I'm even going here indicates that I, that I have some sort of answer in mind that's not start to finish. Because if, if it were, then I wouldn't bother asking this question. So does anybody know where I'm going with that?
Is it necessary to write same views in different words? Well, your essay shouldn't be redundant if that's what you mean. But if you do use, like, if you mean to say, like, values over and over again, yeah, you should probably use different words, like ethics and morals and stuff. We'll get to that in the style part. Okay. Um, here's what you should, here's my recommendation. And then we'll talk about why in a second, because it's going to sound kind of weird. Um, my recommendation is that you should start by writing the body paragraphs. Then write the intro. I mean, obviously not under the body paragraphs. I mean, you know, go back and write it on top. I, you know, like you, you don't put it after the body paragraphs, but you, but then you can write the the conclusion. Does anybody know why? I mean, this might sound like a very weird recommendation. So, why? There's two reasons that I had in mind primarily, but let's see what you guys come up with here. A couple of you guys are typing, so I'll wait and see what you have to say. Yeah, like, okay, Amelia, what Amelia is saying is, is true, that, that's, that, that's definitely a more advanced writerly kind of thing. That may be a little bit ambitious for where I'm going with this. But, um, yeah, okay, that's true. Um, here's what I had in mind. Um, th there are two major reasons. I mean, the first is that, remember, the intro refers to the to the information in the body paragraphs, but the body doesn't refer to the info. It doesn't refer to the intro. So therefore, if you have the body already, then you can write. I think this is what Amelia means by more inclusive. I mean, then you can write an intro that much more specifically refers to what's included in the body. And then the other one is a very, very practical reason, which is this, and this may be the most important, this may be the more important reason. Also, <laughs> if you don't have time to write about all the examples that you intended to write about, then, I mean, if you wrote the intro first, you are screwed. I mean, in, in that case, you, you can just write an intro. You just pretend that's what you wanted to do all along, basically. You, you just, like, let's say you had three examples, but you only had time to include two of them. So, for example, um, for instance, if you had planned three examples, but only got to write about two of them, then afterward, you can just write an intro that only references those two. I mean, you see where we're going with this. If you wrote an intro that mentions three examples, you're dead. Like, not only do you not get to write about the three examples, but then in that time that you don't even have because it's running out, you have to go back and edit your intro. That, that's terrible. You really don't want to be caught in a situation like that. But if you just write as much body as you can write in the time that you have, then you can create an intro that just kind of pretends that whatever you got on there was what you intended in the first place. Very important. So, it's kind of nice. 
you couldn't do this before when it was a handwritten essay because obviously handwritten essay has to be written from start to finish. But because you can type, you have this freedom to create the body paragraphs first and then you can create a, a specific intro that includes exactly what is included and not what, what isn't. So it's, it's kind of neat. Now, how should I write the essay? Are there any do's and don'ts of style? So um, let's talk about that. I, I'm going to give you a few. There's not really any reasonable order to what I'm about to say here. These are just a few random recommendations. But um, the first is um, don't use the first person unless you're talking about yourself or things that happen to you. So the first person means don't use I or, or me or, or whatever. So don't. Don't use it. A lot of people do it. It's a bad habit. Let me, let me show you why not. Consider the following. I think that judges should restrain their power in sentencing first time offenders versus judges should restrain their power in sentencing first time offenders. I mean, you can see what, I mean, the, the first sentence is a lot weaker than the second one. I mean, th this one's a very weak sentence. It sounds like it's just one person's kind of random opinion. And so, so don't use I think, don't use I believe, just say stuff. Okay, a lot of people are, are very steeped in, in like etiquette type things and they really like to say I think and I believe all the time. But I, I, I think and I believe are, they don't really belong in this kind of writing. I mean, Because the reason, if any of you are very tempted to use things like that, I'll tell you why you are. The reason why you are is because most people's dialogue occurs in spoken language. So I think, I believe, etc. Are, are they're like niceties? They're they're politeness. I mean, they're etiquette issues used in spoken language. They don't belong in written arguments. All they do is weaken them. So, yeah. Um, they, don't, they don't belong in written arguments. Um, Jason, yeah, I mean, what I'm, I'm talking more about gratuitous use of the first person, like, I think this. Like, this is not a personal example, but some people still, because in spoken language, people will insert things like I think and I believe all the time. The reason why they do that is so they don't basically make everybody mad at them. I mean, it, it, in order to have civilized dialogue face to face, people include this kind of stuff. But in written language, that is not an issue. So that's one recommendation. Um, another recommendation is try to use different words for the same thing if you have to mention it over and over again. So if you, for example, if you are talking about, for instance, if you say, like, values, meaning moral values, the first time, then try to say, um, try to say ethics or morals, you know, later. But don't try to, I mean, unless it's something that only has one name. Like if it's the Supreme Court, obviously the Supreme Court only has one name. But other than that, try to, you know, if it's, if it's an argument, then maybe next time it's a conflict or maybe it's a, it's a dispute. So if, if you say, um, 
if you say argument, then next time say dispute or disagreement or etc. You know, something like that. Conflict. So try to use different words for stuff. Um, and then finally try to use um, try to use different sentence structures. You don't have to go overboard with this, but you should try um, for strong points, use short sentences. Um, for details, maybe try um, for strong, either strong points or like particularly um, memorable details. Okay, um, let's see. Jason says you should be careful about subtleties of meaning. Jason, I, I agree, but that sort of thing is, is definitely about four levels higher than, than I'm intending this study hall. Like, the, the goal of this study hall is so that it can be... Um, I think the majority audience for these study halls is second language English, so at least from the demographics that I see on the, on the study hall, it definitely is. So the point you're raising is a valid point, but it's, let's just put it this way, if you're at the level where you can worry about that sort of thing, then you do not have to worry about your essay score. So let's put it that way. So um, I, I'm trying to give recommendations that would help out people who have trouble writing essays in English. So same page, different book kind of thing. Um, for strong points, memorable details, try to use short sentences. Um, for, for more detailed descriptions, try to use longer sentences with modifiers or subordinate clauses. Okay. Um, I don't want to give you a million recommendations, so, so there you go. Um, any questions about this? Any questions about any of this? Go ahead and type them in the text box. Okay. Um, and and I, I don't even think I really need to, to write a, a sample essay right now. I do want to get to some discussion about the argument essay. So we'll see how we're doing on time once we get to that point. But I see at least one of you is typing right now. Let's see what you are typing. Okay, smiley face. So, I mean, I hope I've addressed the points that you guys have raised in the text box. Smiley face, if you guys are ready to talk about the other essay type. If you have any further questions, feel free to raise them in the box there. Um, Dinesh says, what's the importance of grammar in the essay? The best way to answer that is just to use let me, let me go ahead and write this as a last point here. Um, use the best grammar and writing that you can without having to write excessively slowly. I, I mean, obviously, if the grammar is just horrendous, then that will count against you. But you, you have to work with what you can work with. I mean, you know, if I give... I, I, you know, the deal is basically that you should just write the best that you can without, without being too slow about it. If, if I gave you excessive grammatical recommendations, the result would be that you would write way too slowly and you would basically accomplish nothing. So the best thing, I, the best response I can give to that question is instead of directly answering the question to just kind of give you this, this recommendation. So best, best you can muster without without being obnoxiously slow. Like if you're revising everything five times, that's bad. Unless you can type, you know, 130 words a minute or something. Okay. Um, there you go. Let's talk about the argument essay a little bit. So the argument essay, remember it's different. It, it, instead of giving you an issue to write about, they give you an argument and you have to critique it. So 
what should be the overall tone of my critique? What should I write about? How should I refine specific points to write about? How should the essay be organized? So here's a sample argument essay. In surveys of Internet users, a rapidly increasing percentage of users have admitted illegally downloading music from file sharing sites. These users should consider the implications of their actions for their favorite artists. Each illegal download of an artist's work costs the artist money. Therefore, by enthusiastically downloading artists' work from the Internet, these users may ironically be helping to put those same artists out of business. Okay. Remember that this is not an issue essay. What you are not doing here is you are absolutely not weighing in on the issue. Like you're not supposed to give your you're not supposed to give like examples or opinions of like illegal downloading and you're not supposed to take a stand on the issue of illegal downloading. It's, it's not what this is. This is an analysis of an argument. It's basically like a giant critical reasoning problem. But one thing that you probably know, if you don't know it, you definitely should know it. The tone of your critique should not be even-handed at all. The critique should be very much critical of the passage. So you should be overall extremely critical of the passage. Your goal should be to find fault with the argument. I mean, you can talk about how to fix those faults, but your primary goal there is to find things that are wrong with the argument. So keep that in mind. Now, what should I write about? Well, let's talk about that. How do you find, and, and I mean, I guess, Let's address this on the same page. How can I find specific points to write about? As far as what should I write about? Yeah, some of you guys are saying flaws. A couple of you guys are typing assumptions. One thing we should take a look at is the directions. The directions are not a joke. So here's the directions. Be sure to analyze the line of reasoning and the use of evidence in the argument. So here's some assumptions. How might you weaken? And then what would strengthen? What changes would make it more logically sound? Does this remind you guys of anything? Aha. Yeah, it's it's like critical reasoning deluxe. It's like one giant critical reasoning problem with no answer choices. The the, the only thing that's not like critical reasoning is is the blue thing. Um but what would help you evaluate? All, all of the orange stuff is like critical reasoning problems. So if you like analyze the line of reasoning, like the analyze the line of reasoning is like There's a couple of, I mean, that's a very general thing. I mean, but th this pertains to boldface, assumption, mostly boldface and assumption questions. In other words, boldface, it's like boldface questions in the sense that you have to figure out which statements are playing what role. So, which statements are doing what. And assumption questions like what stuff is part of the reasoning but isn't actually stated.
So, okay. Use of evidence, same sort of thing, like evidence is supporting um, facts. What questionable assumptions underlie the thinking? So that's, of course, like assumption questions. Um, might weaken or might strengthen. Those are very much like strength and weaken questions on critical reasoning. Note that you're dealing with new information. So note that you would strength and weaken questions, unlike other types of questions, your correct answers are out of scope by necessity. So note that you would be introducing out of scope things. And that's perfectly fine. That's how those things work. And then what would help you evaluate? These are related to evaluate, our, I mean, help evaluate the argument. CRs, which are also in the strength and weaken category. And those are also under the um, umbrella of strength and weaken. Um, the only thing that's different here is the blue thing. And let me explain how the blue thing is different. Um, the, the, the blue thing is different um, because notice the blue thing says you are allowed to speculate on how the actual stated premises might be changed to make the argument better. In other words, you're allowed to change or contradict premises. There's no critical reasoning question on which you would ever do that. Like, in, even in weakening questions, you probably know this. If you don't know this, you definitely should know it. Even in weakening questions, in critical reasoning, the premises are sacred. Like, you never contradict premises and you never change them. Like, even if you have to weaken an argument, you always weaken it by coming at the existing premises from a new angle. But you still take the premises as fact. So the reason the blue part is different is because you are actually allowed to change stated premises, which you cannot do in any existing CR type. So, okay. Um, so yeah, you basically just, just throw these things at the question. So how do I find specific points to write about? If you have trouble finding things to write about, just consider one by one different CR modalities and throw them at the question. So except maybe, except maybe draw the conclusion. Because I mean, you're not going to be drawing any conclusions from the argument, but you will consider, um, so like think like boldface to figure out how the argument works. Then think like find the assumption. And then think like strengthen or weaken or help evaluate. But then there's the blue thing. Think about changes. It's the only thing that's really new. So let's let's take a look. One more question that we have here is how should the essay be organized? So this one, there tends to be a little bit less variety here than, the, than, in, the, um, than in the issue essay. Basically what you should have is, I mean again, if you're an advanced writer, you can certainly, there's a lot of variations on this theme here, but I would say the safest bet would be an intro that basically says something like, you know, while the argument has some 
valid basis. X, 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 X. It is fatally flawed by a number of, of errors in its use of logic and evidence. Specifically, and then you start naming off specifics. So, I mean, you can just do that. Um, by the way, in order to do this, you should, because every single time you write an argument essay, you are absolutely going to be just going crazy with criticism. So you should definitely memorize lots of words for this argument sucks. Here's what I mean. Like, questionable, invalid, um, biased, it, it, it's marred, it's um, illogical, it's unrealistic, it's based on false assumptions. I mean, you can just, you can just go absolutely crazy with this, but, but I, I would say ahead of time you should stock up on words for, for this sort of thing. It's, it's faulty, it's fallacious, it's, it's, it's unsound, you know, et cetera. I mean, so like just basically get to, I mean, take your thesaurus and, and, and memorize the words that you understand. I mean, if you don't know how a word is used, then don't, you, then don't memorize it. But for this purpose. Um, some words are overly harsh. Well, I mean, you know, these, these are not terribly harsh words. I mean, you, you, you don't want to use words that say, like, the argument has no value, or you don't want to say that it's totally useless or it has nothing valuable to say. Like, that would be a little bit overly harsh. But, but none of these words are, are overly harsh. Like, all, all of these words just basically are, are, are balanced critiques. Like, I mean, because none of these are implying that the argument has no value. They're just implying that it, that it has issues. So that, that's different. And then like body paragraphs, usually the, but the safest way to do a body paragraph is one body paragraph per fault. Yeah, this laugh on the wrist is a good way to think about it. Um, biased is used when you have studies that are, that, are not, that are not correctly neutral. You know, like if you... If you want to, like, uh, an example of biased would be, like, if you had a study about how people feel about crime, but you interviewed cops, then you would not get a real sense of how people feel about crime. You know, that's, that's a biased study. So, like, if the collection of evidence is, is not going to be balanced, if it's going to favor one viewpoint over the other, that's what bias means. So, okay. Um, like if you surveyed people on how the economy is doing, but you only surveyed people who are home to answer their phone during the day, that's going to be biased because like you're going to get people who aren't at work. So then they're not going to have a balanced opinion on the economy. So anything involving like surveys or data collection, you can go after biased. Okay. Um, and then you, you, very brief conclusion. Um, if you're running out of time, you can actually manage not to include. You you don't absolutely need a conclusion. Okay. So let me give you an example. Um, and and again, I, I would give the same recommendation as last time. I, uh, I want to know whether the word bias is used in GMAT. Um, well, um, 
mean, it's it's definitely used in. Um, it's definitely used in the reading comp section. So there's a uh, if you look at the the question is if you, uh, about the word bias being used in the GMAT. If you look at 12th edition OG page 360 reading passage, there's a lot of uses of bias in that reading passage. So if you don't know what bias means, you're going to have a lot of trouble understanding that passage. Okay. Um, same recommendation as last time, meaning the recommendation I'm talking about is that you should write the body paragraphs first, then go back and write an intro. That covers those faults. Because I mean, you, what what may well happen is that you you may wind up talking about you may wind up coming up with more stuff than you get a chance to talk about. So like before we close, let me let me just give you a few examples of of this. So the conclusion of this passage is that the users may be helping to put the artists out, out of business. So. Okay, one fault, let me just pick at a few faults that you might find in this passage, certainly not the only ones, but like there's this, each illegal download of an artist's work costs that artist money. I mean, if you're really stuck for ideas, just go sentence by sentence and just look for stuff to criticize. Okay, like I, each, each illegal download of an artist's work costs that artist money. So one way I would go after um, that one would be to say, in using the phrase each illegal download, the, the article makes the grave mistake of assuming that that every illegally downloaded track is one that the user would have bought if it were not available for illegal download. I mean, this this assumption is unrealistic, even ridiculous. Um, most users download hundreds, if not thousands, of tracks that they would not have bought just to sample them. Okay. Um, also, in, in in costing money, another thing you could go after here. Yeah, I mean, like Jason says, there's a lot of problems with these prompts. Don't be shy about attacking them. So another thing you can go there is that um, in making the simplistic, um, the simplistic connection between illegal downloads and monetary loss ignores the fact that artists make money from many other sources. For instance, um, and, and like here's an example. You could use the first person here. Like if you say I downloaded tracks and liked the artist so much that I went to see their concert. But for example, I mean many emerging artists concerts are packed with fans who first heard of those artists through illegal downloads. Um, certainly the, the, um, the losses from those downloads are offset by the ticket prices 
that those fans are paying. Okay, that's like another connection. Um, so these are the implications by enthusiastically, by, by helping by put the same artist out of business. I mean, there's like an implication here that the, the argument also assumes without justification that, that artists will cease to perform if they begin to make less money. You could write a paragraph about that. Like, you know, what if they perform just because they like music or because they just love to, to perform and, and, and so on. Um, also, remember that you can add changes to the argument or things they didn't think about. Um, the argument fails to consider that illegal downloads may be a channel through which unknown artists can gain new fans. Downloads are spread very rapidly. So financial losses may be well worth incurring to gain many new fans. Temporary financial losses. So, you know, you get the idea. And I mean, I'm sure a lot of you guys found other things wrong with this prompt. You know, there, there's plenty of things that, that you could attack. But then you could just put these into your body paragraphs. And let's say this was all you had time to write about. If that's all you had time to write about, then at the head of it, you would say, you know, basically, while this argument does have a point, it is marred by several logical errors, including, you know, ass false assumptions of equivalence between downloads and, and, and purchases, you know, simplistic connections that ignore other links, assumptions made without justification, and the failure to consider additional considerations. You know, there you go. Bang, 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 and bang. So, how about that? In fact, I mean, one thing you um, may be able to do is, okay, because one thing that, uh, one point about this, a lot of you guys are, uh, I, we hear a lot of complaints about running out of critical reasoning problems. There are 34 pages of essay prompts in the official guide. So one thing, especially if you have trouble with strength and weaken questions, one thing you can do is you can actually go to the essay prompts and see what you can do to strengthen or weaken those prompts. That's actually a very good way to develop your skills at strengthening and weakening in particular, but also identifying assumptions and so on. Just to go to those prompts, there are a ton of them. There's like literally like 34 pages of them and see what you can do as far as strengthening or weakening when you don't have answer choices to depend on. You may find that you can grow a lot in terms of, of critical reasoning skill. Um, how about that? Okay, so that's it for today. We're about out of time, but I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope that this presentation gives you a little bit of direction. Because remember where we were going at here was protocol. So now I hope you have a little bit more protocol, a little bit more organizational structure that you can work with so that you don't have to spend as much effort. And also this consideration, um, this whole idea of subcategories, a lot of people stress out a lot over picking a topic. Hopefully doing this will make the selection of topics a lot less of a stressful issue. So, I mean, hopefully we've, we've done a little bit to help achieve these two twin goals here. Remember at the end of the day, don't stress it. You don't, you don't need to be perfect. You don't need to write the next feature piece for the New Yorker. This is, it can be mediocre. Mediocre is fine. The, the point is just to be not spending lots of brain power on this thing. 
Okay. Um, if you have any quick questions, yeah, no, that that won't do unless unless you can type several million words per minute. Okay. Um, quick questions. I'll take. Um, otherwise. All right, I'm going to turn off the recording. Well, I guess I'll leave the recording on until I see what these questions are that you guys are typing. So, okay, that wasn't a question, but you're welcome. All right, I'm going to kill the recording, and uh, let's see, we'll hang out here for about another two or three minutes, see if you guys have any last-minute questions, administrative things, and so on. Remember, this is not the time to submit new topics. This is... That's that's done on the front page of, of Thursday study halls. Also, um, the next one may or may not be on the 16th because uh, we actually have a company-wide holiday event on the 16th, so we may be changing the scheduling of the next study hall. But we will um, we will go from there. Okay, so I'm going to kill the recording right now.